Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you for some time on the subject of abstaining from all alcohol and intoxication. And we're going to be completing this today as we've been talking about answering objections to those who don't want to abstain from alcohol or intoxication. And we'll be summarizing conclusion today as we are going through this important subject that's used. This subject is discussed, wine, strong drink, words relating to this over 400 times in the Word of God. And we see the problem today is we have many Christians that are drinking alcohol. And it is a great mistake. We see in Leviticus 10, verse 9, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when they go into the congregation, tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. We see that there is that which is holy and that which is clean, but we also see that which is unholy and that which is unclean. And that is alcohol and strong drink that is alcoholic, alcoholic wine. God wants us to conquer all the objections to this, and we've been talking about this. We mentioned just briefly, we'll go over some of the things we talked about. The four positions today among Christians are, the majority are the moderationists, which believe that you can drink in moderation as long as you don't get drunk. They don't believe it's a sin to drink alcohol in moderation. They believe God approves the moderate use of alcohol, but he condemns the amount consumed, not alcohol itself. The second group is where they voluntarily abstain because of the negative effects of alcohol, because of the effect on health or mental health, family, society. But they don't believe it's a sin to drink alcohol according to the word. Their abstaining is voluntary, not based on God's word. A third group is abstaining from alcohol except for medicinal uses, believing that they, it, is a, it is a sin to drink alcohol, ex except for that they can use it for medicinal use. We'll be addressing that again today. And the fourth group are those who abstain from alcohol, believe the Word of God, without a shadow of a doubt, teaches absolute abstinence from alcohol, which is a stand that we take, which is what we're proving beyond a shadow of a doubt through this study. We've talked about objections, and we're just going to briefly cover some of the major objections because these are objections that you hear from people not only in the world but in the, in the body of Christ all the time. The first one is the one wine theory, which says that all the words for wine in the Word of God are talking about alcoholic wine. They just assume that it means it's alcoholic. And we gave many scriptures. We'll just look at one scripture that we looked at makes it very clear that that is not true. There are two different kinds of wines. Deuteronomy 32, verse 14. Latter part of this verse. Thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. The word pure is a word that means wine. Look in the lower window if you're here for the first time or have not seen how we show information. We put the cursor over a word in the lower window. It's Strong's number. And then the Greek or Hebrew word, depending upon whether we're in the New Testament or Old Testament. And then the meaning. Notice the meaning is wine. It means wine. Why it was translated that, beyond me. You drink the wine, which is what? The blood of the grape. Young's literal translation, the blood of the grape, thou dost drink wine. Other translations. Here's the LXE, which is the English translation of the Septuagint. He drank wine, the blood of the grape. Here's the New King James Version. They even corrected it. You drink wine, the blood of the grapes. So clearly, it's talking about drinking wine. And what does it define as wine? The blood of the grape. What's the blood of the grape? That's the juice that comes out of the grape. That's grape juice. It's not talking about anything that's alcoholic, because alcoholic wine is produced through the time-controlled fermentation process. The one wine we're theory is false. There are two different kinds of wines mentioned in the Bible, and we spent extensive time talking about these, and we saw that the majority of uses are talking about grape juice, not talking about alcoholic wine. 
A second objection that people say is, well, the water was no good back then, so they had to drink the alcoholic wine, They assuming it was all alcoholic. Not true. We saw the scriptures. The woman at Samaria came to get the water. Jesus asked for a drink of water. Obviously, they drank water. We gave the scripture about Timothy drinking water. He was drinking water. Remember, they didn't want him to drink water, he said, any longer, but he was now he's going to add water to the grape juice, which we'll talk about later. So they drank water. A third objection that comes up is, well, it was impossible to preserve the grape juice back then because they didn't have refrigeration and the means like we have today. Not true. Even Jesus points out that the wine could be preserved when he spoke in Luke chapter 5, verse 38. New wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. They can be preserved. We talked about all the different kinds of ways that wine, which is grape juice, could be preserved. They would boil it down to must, and they would put it in containers. They put it in cold water where it wouldn't ferment, and there was all kinds of different ways that they could preserve it. Another thing that we see is objection is that it's not a sin to drink alcohol. And we pointed out that this is not a true statement. It is a sin, sin to drink alcohol. And the way we can show you this is, number one, the scripture we began with, Leviticus 10, verse 9, says, Do not drink nor wine nor strong drink. Well, if you're told not to drink it, then it must be something that is wrong. And if you disobey God's word, what is that? That becomes a sin. We see another scripture over in Proverbs in chapter 31. Proverbs 31 and verse 4 where it says it's not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes or rulers, those that are in judicial positions, to drink strong drink. No. Well, wh what are we today? We are priests and kings. Should we be drinking anything like this? Absolutely not. Another thing that we see, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. And Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Notice, the wine defiles. Well, if something defiles you, that becomes an area of sin. I mean, it's unrighteous, it's unholy, it's unclean, as we already saw. That means it's an area of sin. God does not want us to have anything to do with it. Drinking of alcohol is sin. Another thing that we know is that alcohol spirits will come into you when you drink alcohol. Well, why do demons come into a person? It's because of giving place to the devil. And how do you give place to the devil? Through sin. Remember what it says in Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place, a place of residence to the devil, this means. How do I give place to the devil? By sinning. So how do alcohol spirits come into me? By sinning. If I drink that, I am sinning and I am opening the door and allowing evil spirits to come into me. Another thing that we mention, one of the things that people will say their objection is they think that God sanctify, that sanctioned alcoholic drinks and approved of them. Not so. And the fact that he told them not to drink, and the fact that he told them that it's, def it's defiling, the fact that it's something that is evil, that's not sanctioning alcohol whatsoever. Instead, it's declaring that it is evil and should have absolutely nothing to do with it. Alcohol wine in itself is intoxicating. It is bad. In fact, we can even see scriptures about this. If we look at uh, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, because the statement is made that God condemns the amount of alcohol that you would consume so you don't get intoxicated but or drunk, but it's okay to have a little. Not so. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine, talking about alcoholic wine, is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. It says what it is. It has nothing to do with how much you have. It just says it is bad. That means that it in itself is evil. It is no good whatsoever. In Deuteronomy, another scripture, in verse 32, verse 33, Their wine is the poison of dragons. <laughs> That's of the devil, isn't it? And the cruel venom of asps, like a venomous serpent snake that bites you. 
Well, that's definitely coming from the devil, that's for sure. In fact, it said it was defiling. Daniel said, this is defiling. I can't have anything defiling coming into me. That means that alcohol is evil in itself. It has nothing to do with how much you partake of. One drink is evil. You should have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Another thing that we addressed and we want to address again is pastors have said that it's okay to drink alcohol in moderation. There's a lot of ministers out there that drink. And they even think it's okay and tell their congregations it's okay. It is a great mistake. We point it out, and we'll point this out again for those who have not seen these scriptures. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, talks about a man desiring the office of a bishop. And a bishop is one who's an overseer, would be like a pastor or someone in a position of authority. It says what a bishop must be. He must be blameless. Well, that means he's to be holy, unclean, no sin in his life. Husband of one wife, can't have plurality of wives. Vigilant. vigilant. The word vigilant normally means watchful, but it's, that's not what the word means here. It's a wrong translation. It is the word nephilios. This particular word means abstaining from wine. And we have proved this, and for you who haven't seen this, We'll show you in the lexicons. We have lexicons that are on here that reveal this. First of all, we'll look at the Freiburg's lexicon, a Greek lexicon. Notice what it says up here in this, where I'm moving my cursor across. Strictly holding no wine without wine. That's what the word means. We see down here at Liddell Scott unmixed with wine, wineless. That's what it means. They don't translate it correctly. It doesn't mean watchful, vigilant, which means watchful whatsoever. So this is talking about anybody that's a bishop or a pastor, someone an overseer. He is to be wineless, abstain from wine, absolutely. Then in verse 3, you see, one of the things we pointed out is there's tremendous problems in the translations. And here's where we see 1 Timothy 3.3 3 says, not given to wine. Some people think, well, this is talking about them not given to wine. No, it's not, because it's a poor translation. The word given is the word didomai in the Greek, translated that most all the time from this Greek word didomai. If I put the cursor over the word given, there isn't even a word for given. It's only one Greek word for the phrase given to wine, and it is a word per oinos. Oinos means wine. Para is a prefix. And this is what the prefix means. It means besides. And we have looked this up. And we saw that, again, this one, in fact, we can even show you this. For those of you who have not seen it, we talk about what this particular one means. It means, well, here's Liddell Scott from the side of, from beside. We see it from Freiburg's. It means to beside. We see from Lao Nida, another one, these are ones that means another location or object usually with the implication of being alongside or close to, alongside or beside. That's what it means. It doesn't mean not given to wine. It means someone who's not by the side of, not beside, near, or alongside of wine, meaning he's not supposed to be around anybody drinking wine. He's not supposed to have fellowship with those people drinking wine. So verse 2 and 3 together, speaking to Bishop, say he's, not, he's supposed to abstain from wine, and he's supposed to not even be around anybody that's drinking alcohol and fellowship with them whatsoever. So that destroys what the pastor has said. And I told you about the one pastor who said that God told him that it was okay to drink wine in moderation. He didn't hear from the Lord whatsoever. He heard from the devil. It was a false teaching. And this guy is a nationally known pastor. What a mistake. People have been deceived big time. Chapter 3, verse 8. Likewise, the deacons. A deacon is a minister. It's diakonos, which means minister. It's been translated minister. The majority of the times it refers to anybody in any capacity of ministry or servant. He's to be grave, not double-tongued, not given to wine. Well, put the cursor over the word given. It's not the word didomai. It's the word proseko. Proseko means to be brought near something. So it's literally saying, not be brought near to much wine. 
Again, same thing. I'm not supposed to be around anybody who is involved with drinking much wine. I shouldn't be around drunkards. I shouldn't be around people that are, that are drinking a lot of alcoholic wine. It's not ta has nothing to do with a person drinking some wine. It's still talking about not being around people that are drinking that, not being brought near to it whatsoever. Verse 11. Here it talks about the wives of the ministers or the deacons. They're to be grave, not slanderers, sober. I put the word over the word, cursor over the word sober. It's the same word, nephilos, that we saw before. This particular word again means, we already saw, means abstain from wine. So, the deacons' wives or the ministers' wives are supposed to be abstaining from wine. Well, obviously, the, the minister is supposed to be abstaining from wine as well, and he's supposed to be away from any kind of alcoholic drink. The wife's supposed to be, the minister's supposed to be. You find every, everybody, any capacity of ministry is to be. Titus chapter 2, verse 2. The aged men, those are the older men ministering to people, must be sober, nephilios, abstaining from wine. Why didn't they translate this correctly? Who knows? I don't know whether they were just deceived or whether they had bias, maybe because they drank or what the problem was, or they just followed other people's translations, all I can tell you is that it's wrong. It does not mean that whatsoever. And then we come to the next one. And this is about the aged women being able to minister to the younger women. They're to be in behavior as becoming holiness. Now, if they're to be holy, that means they're not going to have any uncleanness or any evil about them, right? Not false accusers, not given to much wine. See, because these haven't been translated, it looks like this one says, not given to much wine, that means I can have some, but I can't have a whole lot. Well, first of all, where would you draw the line anyway? I can have one or two, or maybe I can have three or four drinks. Well, if you go to six or eight, too bad, it's too much. Yeah, it's ridiculous. You're intoxicated the first time you take the first drink in some measure. Now, first of all, does this mean what it looks like? No, it's another poor translation. They did such a terrible job. You put the cursor over the word given, this time it's the word dulio. This particular word means to be a slave of or in bondage to. To make a slave of or in bondage to. Well, it looks like it says I'm not to be a slave or in bondage to much wine. Oh, that must mean I can drink a little bit. But again, how do we know things? You have to look at the Greek on everything. And because people don't do this, there's problems. When I have this word doulos up, we have to look at the tense, voice, and mood of verbs. It is critical to understand what's being said. And in this case, it is extremely important because the tense is the perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek describes action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking. So this is talking about something that happened in the past, not a slave to or in bondage to much wine in the past, otherwise they had a problem in the past, with any present effects now, meaning you should not have any alcohol at all now. In fact, you should have cast out the demons and got free of all the effects of it, so it's not even affecting you now if you're going to be able to minister effectively to someone. It has nothing to do with them being able to partake of some now. The key is the perfect tense, and without looking that up, people have uh, been deceived. The bottom line is anybody in any capacity of ministry, whether you are a bishop or a pastor or a minister, I don't care what you are in any way of trying to minister, you are not to have any alcohol or even the bishops and pastors are not supposed to be near anybody whatsoever. Anybody but partake of alcohol is not fit and not even qualified to minister, period. That's what the Word of God declares. Now, we looked at a lot of the Old Testament scriptures. We brought these up again so you could see these because they're pretty important because the people have been deceived about it in the body of Christ. We looked at many of the Old Testament scriptures, and the problems that we saw were that many of those scriptures where they misunderstood the fact that the word for wine, which is the word yayin, the main word, is not just meaning alcoholic wine. It is a general term for wine that can mean grape juice wine or alcoholic wine, depending upon the context. And we pointed that out and looked at scriptures. And also the same with the word shekar, which is the word for strong drink, which can, is a general word for the sweet drink that they had 
if it was a sweet drink that was non-alcoholic, it was a sweet drink that pleased them, it was from the juice from the dates, from the, the date palms, and if it, not, if it was fermented, then it was called strong drink, where it was an alcoholic. But because people have not looked at that and understood that, and it's seen this from even from studying in Bible dictionaries, which it brings it forth clearly, then they're deceived on all these things. So this is why we have problems. We're going to continue on in the New Testament talking about things that people say. And the next objection is people say, well, Jesus drank alcoholic wine. <laughs> Lots of people say that out there. And so they think that justifies them. Matthew 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they be say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publics and sinners. Well, wait a minute. It says he was eating and drinking, just drinking. doesn't say what he was drinking. And who said he was a gluttonous and a wine bibber? Does the word say he was one? No. They say that he's one. It's recording what the people said. Does that mean he is one? Absolutely not. Jesus would have nothing to do with anything that's unclean, that's unholy, that's a mocker, that's raging, that deceives you, that's a poison of asps, you know, that's the cruel venom, you know, of asps and the poison of dragons. <laughs> no way in the world. Jesus was not involved in drinking alcohol at all. In fact, in Luke chapter 5, look what it says about what he would do, what he came to do. In verse 30, the scribes and Pharisees were murmuring against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Well, this time it doesn't say what they were accusing him of, of being a wine-bibber and a glutton. Jesus answering said, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Otherwise, he went to the sinners to preach the gospel to them, to call them to repentance, so they would believe the gospel and come to the Lord. Jesus came to seek and save that was lost. That's why he was with them. He was not involved with alcohol whatsoever. We can even see that alcohol, Jesus would have never touched alcohol because even when he's on the cross, he didn't partake of any when he had an opportunity to. It was given to him. Mark 15, 23, here he's on the cross. There was a common um, thing that they did for people that were dying, such as being crucified, that they would give them a drugged wine in order to relieve their pain and their misery while they were dying, like just drug them out. Mark 15, 23 says, they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh. The word wine mingled with myrrh, when you look it up in a, in a Bible dictionary, it describes that, that it is a drugged wine that they gave them. It was like a strong drug that would just w take away their senses, just like putting them out of their minds so they wouldn't realize what was happening as they were dying. Did Jesus receive it? No. It says he received it not. Jesus would not have alcohol whatsoever. So the teaching that says Jesus drank alcoholic wine is a lie. He would have drank the grape juice. He would have drank water. We know he drank water for sure. Another thing that people say is that the fruit of the vine, we did address that last week on Sunday when we were here, if you were here. The fruit of the vine, they say, is alcohol. And they're saying that this is what you're supposed to use in communion, which is a lie. Matthew 26, 29, Jesus said, I'll not drink their henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. What's the vine? The grape juice, a grape vine. What gets coming from the grapevine? Grapes. That's the produce of the harvest. That, so the fruit of the vine are grapes. What do grapes produce? Grape juice. This is not talking about alcohol. We pointed out that in any of these passages, talking about when he was at the Last Supper and he was talking about drink, um, how he was giving his body, remember, and how he was, uh, his blood was going to be shed for the remission of sins and the blood of the New Testament. He never mentioned the word wine whatsoever. In fact, he was careful to not even say that. He said the fruit of the vine, making there be no confusion, no question, it's not talking about alcohol whatsoever. And we did see, there's one other scripture that we'll look at, that we looked at the last week. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8. It tells you what comes out of the grapes and what is described. Isaiah 65, verse 8. 
Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, the cluster of grapes that produces the grape juice. So what's the grape juice? It's the new wine, which is the fresh new wine, the freshly pressed wine. That's what it was. So the fruit of the vine is not alcohol. It was the grape juice. And that is what we should be partaking of, in which we understand. But many people, unfortunately, there's many Christians out there, whole denominations, and even people that are just Christians that aren't involved in denominations that think that taking alcohol, alcoholic wine, is okay. In fact, what you're supposed to do when you take communion. It's ridiculous. Alcohol, wine, which is unclean, which is unholy, would never represent the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 7, it speaks about Christ, our Passover sacrifice for us, and it speaks of the fact that, that a little leaven, which is a type of sin, would leaven or contaminate the whole lump. And then it talks about purging out the old leaven, getting rid of the, the sin, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. When I put the cursor over the word unleavened, it is the word adzumos, which means unfermented. Jesus was fulfilling unleavened bread, wasn't he? Where he was going down paying the price for sin, bearing it away in the three days and three nights. He was unleavened. That means he was unfermented. That means he would have never had any alcohol whatsoever. So a representative of his blood would be something that's, that's unfermented. Another scripture that people bring up that it needs to be addressed is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, over in verse 21. Moderationists will say <clears throat> the fact that this is talking about drinking alcoholic wine. And these guys were drinking it at home and they were drinking it when they were taking the Lord's Supper. And they try to make this contention. This again is because we have a problem in the translations of words. 1 Corinthians 11.21 For in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper. So they're talking about eating and what you eat and drink when you have a meal, right? One is hungry and another <clears throat> is drunken. Do you get drunken when you're eating a supper? No, you're feeding your body, aren't you? Well, hungry is one who is hungering. It's actually, it's a present tense verb. Drunken is the word methuo, which doesn't always mean alcoholic drunk. We pointed this out already before. Doesn't mean that. The word methuo is a word which does not mean those things. Instead, methuo is a word which means to be drinking something to the full, to drink a lot, to be filled to the full in some way. Because this is contrasting someone who's hungry with someone who is not, who is full. Someone's not full, someone who is full. That's what the contrast is. In fact, if we go back here, we even see what Paul's talking about. He says, now in this, in verse 17, I declare unto you, I praise you not, or I commend you not, I'm not approving you. When you come together, not for the better, but the worse. You're coming together for a wrong purpose, is what he's saying to them. And he comes to verse 20, he says, When you come together, therefore, in one place, this, it, this is not there. Or get this, this, it's italicized. It literally says, is it not to eat? Is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? Otherwise, that was supposed to be their purpose, coming together to eat the Lord's Supper. And so, were they do, doing what they should have done? No. In eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. Meaning some were eating beforehand, and they were having a meal. They were bringing together all the people for a meal, and then they were going to have the supper afterwards. So they took before their own supper, talking about people who had the rich ones who had a lot of money. They were eating their own supper beforehand. And now they came for this meal, this festive meal that they were going to have, and then after that, take communion. One's hungry, and one is not full, is really what this would mean. They didn't translate it correctly. Not full, because it's contrasting this. So why would, why would this, why were they not full? Because when they brought this, it was like having a potluck. They weren't bringing enough food for everybody. And the guys who didn't have much food, they were hungry. It was not enough food for us. And the other guys were already full because they already ate at home their own supper. That's what it's talking about. And so, said, what, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Despise ye the church of God, because he's correcting them, saying you should, you're having a meal and you shouldn't be having it. You should have been having it at home, not coming together. And furthermore, 
the guys who had a lot of money were eating all their good food and they weren't bringing hardly any in and so the, when they did have the meal and the hungry people were staying hungry. He was, the whole thing was messed up. Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise you the church of God and shame them have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. He would not condemn them or approve of them whatsoever. He was condemning them instead. Moderationists have thought that it's talking about alcoholic wine. It is not, because what it's doing, it is a contrast between those who are hungry and those who are full, those who have eaten their food at home. Hungering is contrasted with a guy who's, not, who, who's full. So the not filled man contrasted with the completely filled man. That's what it's talking about in the context. Now, what moderationist people will say is, well, this is saying the fact that, that uh, you know, Paul didn't address this at all about, about saying anything because it was okay to drink alcohol. We well, never does talk about alcohol or, or correcting them for being drunk on alcohol. Why? Because it wasn't talking about alcohol. It was talking about the fact that they were being selfish in one, they're eating at home, and then when they had a meal, they weren't even providing for the hungry. And furthermore, they were doing what was wrong. God did not want them to be doing these things at all. They were supposed to be partaking of communion in a holy sense, and they weren't supposed to be doing it, combining it with a fellowship meal. And so therefore, that was wrong. And we come down to verse 33. He tells them what they should have been doing. Wherefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. If any man hunger, let him eat at home. When you come not together unto condemnation, that you come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Otherwise, he's correcting them that they should not have been coming for a meal. They should be eating at home. And then when they come together for the Lord's Supper, then that should be their purpose. People have taken this to think that this is okay, saying it's fine for you to drink alcohol, thinking it's referring to alcohol has nothing to do with it at all. Paul was correcting There's no mention about alcohol. In fact, they say, well, the reason it's talking about because there was a problem with alcohol. Well, it does mention that they had a problem with alcohol in 1 Corinthians 5.11 when it says that if I've called you not to keep company, if any man's called a brother, be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, or a drunkard, or someone who's intoxicated. Yeah, they did. But he also, they for, the also, in chapter 6, he corrected them on the problem, and they did receive the correction. Because he says in verse 9, Know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abuse themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor the drunkards, who are people that are intoxicated, nor revilers or extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. He was telling them that, and then he says, such were some of you. That's what you were in the past. But you are washed. You've been washed clean. You've been washed away. In fact, this says, literally, they'd washed away for themselves their problem, because it's a middle voice, meaning the, sub, the subject which they had done this for themselves, because the middle voice means the subject does it for his own benefit. So otherwise, they got themselves washed free of all these problems. It says, now you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. So these guys had come to repentance. Was this a problem? No, it wasn't a problem. It says Paul was not even addressing this whatsoever. So this, again, is a false claim by those moderationists that think that it's okay to drink and want to use alcoholic wine in communion. It's an abomination. In fact, when we think about it, could the blood of Jesus be represented by anything that is alcoholic? Absolutely not. First Peter 1.19 But the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's what we were redeemed with. <laughs> that wouldn't be something that's fermented or alcoholic or unholy or profane. No way. So again, people have been deceived. All those who would be partaking of communion with alcohol are wrong. Communion would be unleavened bread and unfermented grape juice would be representative of the blood of Jesus. All churches and Christians that are using alcoholic wine and in communion are not only wrong, they're in sin, as they are showing something to be a representative of the blood of Jesus, which is an abomination unto God. Alcoholic wine, using communion, is an abomination 
Every Christian or church that's doing it needs to repent and stop it. Luke chapter 5. <coughs> In Luke chapter 5, we see something else. Again, people's scholarship has been poor. In verse 37, Jesus is speaking here, no man puts new, brand new, fresh wine, this is talking about grape juice then, into old bottles. The new wine, the grape juice wine, will burst the bottles and be spilled and the bottles will perish. The new wine, this new grape juice wine, will be put into new bottles and both are preserved. So what is the subject? New wine, grape juice wine, not something that's fermented. Then it says, no man also having drunk old wine straightway desires new, for he says the old is better. Now, when we're talking about the old, what is that talking about? Older grape juice wine, because that's the context there. Isn't that, the people have tried to say, well, the old means fermented wine. It doesn't say that at all. It doesn't have any inkling showing that it's al alcoholic wine. The old would be that which is prior to the new wine. And really, what this is really pointing to as far as the spiritual revelation, he's talking about the old covenant is that men think it's okay, but the new covenant is what's the real better thing until they taste of it and partake of it. That's really what he's talking about here in bringing revelation to them. But the modernists thought it was, moderationists think it was supposed to be alcoholic when it has nothing to do with it. They, they, it's taught, the context is talking about grape juice wine, new grape juice wine. Another thing that people will say, and this is a common one, well, you know, Jesus turned the water into alcoholic wine at the wedding. Not true. It is a lie from the devil. John 2, 9. Here's one, the water that now is made wine. Verse 10. Every man at the beginning does set forth a good wine. When men have well drunk, in fact, this is the word methuo. Remember we told you it doesn't always mean drunken. This means that they've well drunk. They drunk a lot. They drank not talking about drinking and being drunken, when they have drunk, well drunk, then that which is worse, but which means inferior or not as good, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So, people have assumed that this is talking about alcohol. Not at all. The word good is the word kalos in the Greek, which means beautiful. And this was the beautiful, good, excellent in quality is what this means. Excellent in quality. Good, or kalos is something that's excellent. The ones that were the excellent in quality wines were the ones that were the best wines, which were the ones that had no fermenting in them whatsoever. They were the grape juice that had no, no ferment, nothing fermented whatsoever. That was considered the best wines. They were the freshest wines that weren't fermented. Furthermore, how do you get alcoholic wine. It's got to go through the time-controlled fer fermentation process. This water was turned into wine and then presented instantly. Did it have any time to go through fermenting process? No. It's not talking about alcoholic wine. It's talking about grape juice. Even the Roman writers, Pliny and Plutarch, some of the ones that are in historical, wrote that the good wines were the ones that were the best wines that never would intoxicate. Furthermore, if Jesus would have made alcoholic wine, He'd have contributed towards the indulgence of, of, the, of them drinking uncleanness, things that were poison of asp, you know, I mean, poison of dragons and venom of asp and evil stuff. He'd been encouraging intoxication and drunkenness. <laughs> no way. Furthermore, it says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain and Galilee and manifested forth his glory. The glory of God, does that manifest alcohol and, ferment, and something that's fermented and unclean and unholy? No way. Not so. It was made grape juice wine, not alcoholic wine. Another one that people bring up, Acts chapter 2, verse 13. Others, this is when they were speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost, <coughs> they were mocking him, mocking them, saying, these men are full of new wine. Now, in making a mocking statement, these guys knew that the disciples were those who followed Jesus. Jesus didn't drink alcoholic wine. The disciples didn't drink alcoholic wine. They didn't have anything to do with it whatsoever. The word new wine is the word glucose. If you look below, where we get our word for sugar from, glucose. 
It was the sweet juice pressed from the grape, the sweet wine. It was not alcoholic whatsoever. So instead of saying these men are full of new wine, why would they say that? Because they were mocking them, knowing that they did drink the sweet wine. And they were saying, oh, these guys have been drinking the sweet wine. It made them all drunk. They're mocking them because they were speaking in tongues, which, of course, wasn't true. They were speaking in tongues by the Holy Spirit. So they were mocking them in, in this way because it was common knowledge that the apostles abstained from intoxicating wine. In fact, one of the church historians, his name was Hegesippus, Asippus, he said that James, the brother of the Lord, he was holy from his mother's womb. He drank no wine of alcohol or strong drink, none. The disciples were people that stayed away from this kind of thing. So all of these claims, these are common claims, are all lies. And unfortunately, so many people have believed them. And so they've been deceived. They've been deceived because of false teaching, false poor scholarship, which is a problem. Another thing which we did address, which we'll address for a moment here, was about moderationists who do claim, well, we can drink, and they'll run over to the reason, oh, you can drink it for medicinal reasons. No, we pointed this out, and we'll cover this briefly. For those of you who have not heard this, Proverbs 31, remember what it said? Not for kings to drink wine. What would it do? If they drink, it causes them to forget or cease to care, this means, the law, and pervert. It would pervert or change or alter. This is an appeal stem. Change and alter the judgment of any of the afflicted. Otherwise, affect your mind. It's going to affect you adversely. Then it says, give strong drink unto him that's ready to perish, someone who's dying. And wine to those that be of heavy hearts. Heavy means bitter or painful. Hearts is really the word soul. It's nefesh. We've talked about all this in the past. So what's it talking about here? It's talking about someone giving strong drink to a guy who's ready to die, who's he's in bitter pain in his soul because of the fact that he's dying in the state that he's in. So it's someone giving that to him. And furthermore, it talks about let him drink and forget his poverty. The word poverty can also refer to a destructive state. A destructive state. And remember his misery. What misery? The misery is dying. He's about to die. No more. In other words, this is like a physician giving strong drink to somebody that's at the point of death to relieve him from his misery. Is this something that someone can use as a reliever for their problems? No. Not at all. In fact, Proverbs 23 really already addresses this in verse 29 and following. Who has woe? Who has grief and despair? Who has sorrow? He's, you know, he's all upset and sad. Who has contention, strife? Who has babbling? This means complaints. Who has wounds without a cause? This means someone who's been, something's been done to them, victimization, they've been hurt, wounded undeservedly. Who has redness of eyes? Someone who's been drinking. Should they be doing these things? No. Those that tarry long at wine. They were drowning in their troubles. They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not upon the, upon the wine when it's red. It gives its color in the cup and it moves aright, itself aright. Because what's it going to do to you? At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. It brings destruction. So it's saying, you don't do these things to try to relieve your problems. No. Alcohol was condemned as a reliever or drowning out your problems. It would only be given as something that a physician would give. And essentially what it's saying is that alcohol is only fit to kill the excruciating pain and bring them out of their misery of someone who is dying. That's one scripture that has nothing to do with a person partaking of himself. The second scripture that people use and this is important to see. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 5, over in verse 23. <clears throat> it says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now, this one is one that we took some time for, and for you who haven't seen this, we'll just take a few minutes to show you this. It looks like it's saying, Don't drink water anymore, just drink a little wine. And they have said, this is alcoholic wine. Well, it's not, for your stomach's sake and infirmities. 
Number one, look at New King James Version down here. No longer drink only water. They've added a word to it, only. This is in 14 other translations as well besides this. Why did they add this? Because they're trying to describe something that is shown forth in the Greek that wasn't really the best way to do it, but this is why they're saying no longer drink only water. Because it's not saying don't drink water, period. It's saying no longer drink only water. That means otherwise you're going to drink water with something else. It says, but use a little wine. Now, in order to show you this, this particular word, wine here, <clears throat> is a little bit technical, but you'll get it. When I put the cursor over this word, wine, this is the, the Strong's from the Scrivener's Greek translation, uh, Scrivener's that, go, that is uh, behind the King James Version. It is in the dative case. Now this, you probably won't understand this if you don't know Greek. The dative case in the Greek is the indirect object in the Greek. If you know from your English, when you would say a verb and then a word after that, it would be the direct object. A indirect object is, usually has to with it, to something, or it can also be like with something. In this phrase, use a little wine, use is the verb, the, uh, the, the subject would be like you, you, use, verb, a little wine, wine would be like the direct object in that statement. But it's not a direct object in the Greek. It's a dative. If it was a direct object, it would be what's called the accusative case. The dative meaning it's an indirect object, which means that it would be translated to or it could be translated with, depending upon how it looks, how it would fit in the context. That would be the smartest way, because it's talking about using with a little wine as an indirect object. So what's the direct object? There isn't one in the Greek, but it's implied by the sentence that the direct, direct object is water. This is why the translators in 15 different translations said no longer drink only water, implying that you're going to continue to have water. Use water as an, as an implied direct object with, if it was an indirect object, with a little wine. That would be the best way to translate it. If I was translating it, I would translate it no longer drink water, but use water, and put probably in parentheses an implied direct object, with a little wine for your stomach's sake. Now, why is all that important? Well, it's all important because you've got to understand what they did for people with stomach problems in the ancient days. You can look this up in Bible dictionaries. Fresh grape juice wine, what they did, they would preserve it, they boil it down to like must, a syrup, and then when they wanted to use it, they would add water, sometimes they'd add two, three, four, five parts water or more to it, and then the water with a little bit of the grape juice was used for their stomach. That's what it's talking about. That's why it says a little grape juice. Water plus a little bit of the grape juice was what they used for their stomach. Because what was in the grape juice? All these antioxidants that would help them. That's the reason they did it. This is not talking about alcohol. You say, well, I see that, but that doesn't quite convince me. Well, we can convince you a little bit more. Because we, the proof is really shown in the fact that this is Paul commanding, because this is a commanding statement, by the way. He's, he's really telling them uh, what to do. Where it's, or here's the, it's an imperative mood uh, statement here. So he's telling them, don't drink water any, any, only water anymore, but now use water with a little of wine. Why? Because they are going to mix this together. And why would this not be alcohol? The reason is because if you look up the word Timothy, you find it's used 28 times in the New Testament. In fact, in talking about Timothy, Timothy was his right-hand man. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. He talks about Timothy, my own son in the faith. 
He was my uh, genuine, it means genuine, essentially, or sincere child in the faith. I mean, he was really close to him. And also, if you look at all the letters that were written to the churches, six of the letters that were written were by Paul and Timothy, not just Paul alone. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God. This is in Philippians 1.1, Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, 2 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, Philemon 1.1. 1, 1. Every one of them says about Paul and Timothy. We looked at that together. He was his right-hand man. 1 Thessalonians 3 says, verse 2, Timotheus, our brother, minister of God. He's a minister. This is the word diakonos that we saw before that was translated deacon, remember? But it used minister most of the time, means minister. And it's, remember, the minister wasn't supposed to even supposed to be near wine. His wife wasn't supposed to, was supposed to abstain from it. So ministers are not even supposed to be around any kind of alcoholic wine at all. And Timothy was, an, was, was that. But also, what else was Timothy? 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 22, the last verse, tells you what Timothy's position was. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit, grace be with you, amen. The second epistle unto Timotheus ordained the first bishop of the church of Ephesians. He was a bishop. Could bishops drink wine? No. He was a bishop. Even before that, he was a minister. He was Paul's right-hand man. Would Paul have commanded him to have alcohol? That would have been telling him to sin. No way. He told him to take the grape juice with the water. A little of the grape juice with the water. That is what they used in order to relieve stomach problems because of the antioxidants that were in the grape juice. This is not talking about alcohol whatsoever. There's no justification for those ones that abstain from alcohol except for medicinal use. No, it's not to be used for medicinal use whatsoever. Another thing that we want to address, look at what the statements were if we go through this to the churches. Did any of the, were any of the churches told, told it's okay for alcohol? No. Romans 13, verse 13. Let us walk honestly as a day, not in wine and drunkenness or intoxication. Methay means intoxication of any type. We're supposed, not supposed to be intoxicated at all. Over in 1 Corinthians, to so the church at Corinth, in chapter 5, verse 11, we saw this earlier. You aren't even supposed to eat with someone who is an intoxicated in any capacity. You weren't supposed to have fellowship with them any longer whatsoever. We see in the Galatian church, intoxication is considered a work of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest. And it talks about this in verse 21. Here's the works of the flesh listed here. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, which is intoxication. Methay means intoxication of any type. Revelings and of such like, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> we also saw the scripture over in Ephesians, and we pointed this one out to you in the past. Verse 18. Be not intoxicated with alcoholic wine. And we pointed out wherein is excess is a mistake in the translation. The word excess means, does not mean excess. It means someone who's in an abandoned, desolate life. Someone who is reckless, immoral, not safe, not being saved. It literally says, it's number 810. In fact, I'll even show you in the Strong's. I left this up here. This is Asotia and the Strong's in the Lightning Bible program. Look what it says its meaning is. Not being saved. Someone who's involved in debauchery, it means, or evilness. And what's it talking about? We pointed out to you that there's two words behind this. And this is the word hos. This particular word, we pointed out in the Greek, is a relative pronoun. A relative pronoun. A relative pronoun in the Greek is talking about another noun. It's taking the place of a noun. 
And in order to find out what it is, it has to agree in gender and in number. Notice the gender and the number, masculine, singular. Well, what else in here is the same gender and number? I put the cursor over the word wine, masculine, singular, gender. So this is literally saying wherein or in which, referring to wine, is what is abandoned, desolate life, what is absolutely evil, which is condemned. It's a condemnation against alcoholic wine. It's not talking about drunkenness. See, what people say, they think the excess is referring to being excess of drinking, alcohol. It's not even the word excess. It doesn't mean that whatsoever. We already pointed this out in the past about this. In the church at Thessalonica, so he's condemning it here. Church at Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 6, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and abstain from wine, essentially. This is the word nepho, which is a form of the word nephilos, which means abstain from wine. And he talks about those that sleep at night and those that are drunken or drunk in the night, comparing the ones that are drunken with those who are abstaining from wine. This again is the word nepho. It doesn't mean sober. It means abstain from wine. We brought all this out in the past. Otherwise, every single church is being condemned. And we saw with Timothy, who was the bishop over the church at, at Ephesus, they were condemning wine, and it was not to be for bishops, for ministers, for aged men, aged women. Nobody is supposed to have this whatsoever. And at Crete, this is the one at Crete, where it talks about the, the, the Titus is speaking to Crete. Is, is, Titus is speaking to Titus, who was the bishop over Crete, the church at Crete. And he talks about here again, aged men are to be abstaining from wine. Otherwise, every one of these churches, Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesians, Thessalonica, and the ones where Timothy was the bishop over Ephesus, and as well as the one at Crete where Titus was, it's condemning it continually. Absolute condemnation of this. Now, I'm going to address another issue before we summarize a couple things. And this is about the subject of marijuana and medical marijuana. Marijuana is no good. It is evil. It is a mind-altering drug. It contains many drug compounds. It affects your brain functioning, prevents learning, formation of memory. It causes you to be mentally lazy. It contains THC, which is a drug that's harmful not only to the body, but also to the mind. And it produces a high uh, which significantly impacts the brain activity, affects learning and even memory functions. In 1985, marijuana was considered a Schedule I illegal drug by the federal government, having no medical value or high risk for abuse. And the way it works in the brain is that the THC has got the evil. It affects your mind, affects the brain cells in what's called the cannabinoid receptors. You could look this up and study it if you want you know, as far as a lot of the technical things. But what marijuana does is it overreacts these receptors and it causes this euphoria high feeling in a person and it affects their perceptions, their mood, their impaired coordination, their difficulty in thinking, uh, disrupts their learning. It causes you to be out of your mind. You know, if you ever were involved in this, you know you're, you're out of your mind. You're not at all right, you're high. It affects the development of brain. In fact, in a study in New Zealand, they showed that people who began smoking marijuana heavily in their teens lost an average of eight points in their IQ and their cognitive abilities were not fully restored even after they quit as adults. Otherwise, it has permanent brain damage just like alcohol has permanent brain damage. Number of studies have connected chronic marijuana use with mental illness. It can produce a temporary psychotic reaction hallucinations, paranoia, and other studies have, have linked it to patients who, who have had mental problems afterward of schizophrenia, paranoia. It's been linked to depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, personality disturbances, lack of motivation, all kinds of things. It impairs your judgment and your motor coordination. It also can contribute to accidents. Studies have even shown that marijuana and alcohol is, is worse when they're combined together than the one is alone as far as driving impairment. And so the Surgeon General's warning was uh, that this was, had no beneficial effect. 
There was a report that was submitted to Congress from reviews by scientific and medical reports that came in, which were supposedly to show that it was going to be a, something helpful. It showed that it was not accepted whatsoever. But here's the thing that you need to know. People say, well, what, what about all this stuff about the medical marijuana? First of all, we have morphine today, don't we? Morphine is used as a painkiller, and it's not a bad thing. It just, it's not, it just, just kind of pain, kills the pain. Where does it come from? It comes from opium, which produces heroin. Well, shall we go smoke some uh, opium and take some heroin and so we get our morphine? No. It is something that is taken out of it. It is a found in it, and it's taken out of it and used as a chemical morphine for as a painkiller. Otherwise, you wouldn't be using the opium or the heroin. It's what's been taken out of it. It's the same thing with marijuana. There have been shown that there are some components that can be taken out of marijuana called Marinol and Sesame, or the two that are just prescribed today, approved by the FDA as approved medications. The THC is not in it. It's been, take, it's been taken out of this. So my point is that these are approved by the FDA, by scientists, by medical people that have done this, uh, that have studied this out, showing that there could be some benefits, not from the medical marijuana, which is taking it with the THC. That's deceptive. The thing, that all these people trying to get medical marijuana approved, you get the THC with it, which means it hallucinates you. In fact, who are the ones, the average person, who wants these, has a history of drug and alcohol abuse and no history of life-threatening disease. They just want to get high. That's the whole reason why they want it. And they see a tremendous link between medical marijuana and increased drug use. It's just feeding their drug problem. It's no good whatsoever. We should not have anything to do with it. Anything that intoxicates is evil. So it's deceptive. Now, if you have components that are taken from that, from talking about chemicals that can be a use, then that is a different situation. At the same time, though, there have been statements made by doctors who have said that for every disease and disorder, this is from a guy named John Peterson, president of the Illinois Society of Addictive Med Addiction Medicine, said for every disease and disorder for which marijuana has been recommended or these drugs, that they, these, these things that they've taken out, the, the, uh, the chemicals, there's a better FDA-approved medication. Otherwise, it's not the answer. There's better medications that are out there. Why are people wanting this? They're just wanting to feed their drug stuff, their drug addictions, and it's no good. Otherwise, we shouldn't have anything to do with any drugs that intoxicate. Components from marijuana or whether it was coming from opium or whatever that have been approved for a particular use because of the chemicals used, that could be a beneficial thing as far as, you know, outside of that, it should not be used. My point is, medical marijuana should never be approved. It's total deception. All these states have made great mistakes in it. It's only the things that have been taken out, the chemicals. So you need to know that. And you should have nothing to do with it. You know, we should never have to do with alcohol. If they ever would legalize marijuana, you know, we keep resisting that. You don't ever have anything to do with it. It's all evil. And it's going to let demons come into you, and you are going to have all kinds of problems. And demons will come into you. Let me bring a conclusion to you. Number one, the word condemns alcohol. We've seen it. The church was against alcohol in the past. That's how they got the 18th Amendment passed in 1919, prohibiting alcohol. Unfortunately, it got repealed 14 years later in 1933. The word says, don't drink alcohol or wines or strong drink. Well, that means it's sin. Two kinds of alcohol, as we saw. The one wine theory is false. God approved the new wine, which is the grape juice wine, which is a blessing to man. He disapproved the alcohol wine, which man made through the fermentation process. All alcohol and intoxicating beverages are unclean, they're unholy. The word condemns the nature of alcohol itself, and not just how much you would drink. It's itself it's been condemned. Even one drink will have some kind of a negative effect upon you. Jesus did not consume alcoholic beverages. He did not turn the water into alcoholic wine. It's all a lie. Alcohol's bad. And they, of all the scriptures we saw when we went through the list of all the evil scriptures, the scriptures talking about the evilness of alcohol, here's the summary. 
It's unholy. It's unclean. It's a mocker. It's raging. It deceives the person. They're getting some cause them to be intoxicated, affecting their being able to reason. It's not for kings or priests. It would make you worthless, good for nothing, unprofitable, and wicked. It inflames you. It causes you to err and stumble in judgment. It defiles you. It can cause you to be violent. It will hinder you and, and it also make, disqualifies you for ministry. It's a work of the flesh. It's unrighteous. It's fermented, making a person for leavened or sinful. It makes you unqualified for any aspect of ministry. The word is absolutely indi as an indictment against alcohol as reckless, immoral, corrupt, depraved, causing one not to have any hope of safety, not safe, debauchery, dissipation, not being saved. Evil spirits will enter into you if you drink alcohol. The result of consuming alcohol and being intoxicated is you're going to have all kinds of curses on your body, on your mind, affects your body, affects your mind, and we talked about that. And also, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Christians, pastors, Christian organizations have been deceived into thinking that you can drink alcohol in moderation or for medicinal effect. It's all wrong. You and I are unleavened. We're to be unfermented. Now, regarding answering the question about, well, can I have fellowship with people that are drinking alcohol? If they're a brother, remember what 1 Corinthians chapter 5 will bring this up. Verse 11 says, people say, well, what do I do with some of these people? If they're a brother and they're alcohol drinker, intoxicated, you don't even eat with them. <coughs> you have no fellowship with them. How about with someone who's not a brother? Well, Jesus was around them to witness to them, to call them to repentance, to minister to them. You're not going to be fellowshipping with them, but you're going to be ministering to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, alcohol is not for personal medicinal use. It's only fit to be given by a physician to relieve their suffering when they're dying. As far as if you have problems with alcohol or any kind of drugs, you can get free of it. How? First of all, confession of sin. Secondly, a godly sorrow that works repentance. Thirdly, casting out all the spirits that have come in from the alcohol or the marijuana or drugs or whatever intoxicating thing you've had and drive them out until they're all gone. The conclusion is the moderate drinking, as long as one doesn't get drunk, is false teaching. That you voluntarily abstain because of health, mind, or society, society reasons, false teaching. That you abstain from alcohol except for medicinal use, false teaching. The truth is, all believers are to abstain from all alcohol and intoxication. It's absolutely the conclusion of the Word of God. Now, one other quite thing we want to point out. Why don't all Christians agree on this? Here's the bottom line. You've seen it probably in this series more than any that I've done. The poor scholarship, the mistakes in translation, the mistakes in meaning of words, the lack of understanding Greek and Hebrew and studying in order to find out what the truth is. Briefly, the word in the Old Testament, yayan, it's a general word for wine. It can mean either one, one of the two kinds, not always alcoholic. New wine, tarosh, is grape juice. We saw all the scriptures on that. The strong drink word, shekar, can mean either one. It's a general term. You have to look at the context. In the New Testament, oinos, they think it's always alcoholic wine. It can be either one. We already proved that. The word methuo which means drunken when you drink alcoholic wine to the full. It also means simply to drink to the full or to be filled up with something. It's not, it's just a general term, not always talking about alcohol. We also pointed out the tremendous mistakes. Ephesians 5.18, where excess didn't mean excess at all. It refers to being reckless, immoral, corrupt, depraved, not saved, not being, not safe. It's terrible. Also, we saw the mistakes in translation, such as vigilant. Vigilant means watchful. The word nephilos means abstain from wine. How they come up with that is beyond me. And then also, all the places, think of all the places where it said, not given to wine, not given to much wine. Every one of those were all wrong. One of them was peroinos, not beside wine, not by the side of wine or near wine or alongside it. Another one was about prosecco, about being brought near to much wine. And the other one in Titus about not given to much wine was not a slave or in bondage to much wine. They totally have missed it in the translations. And then also not understanding the perfect tense, which is mandatory in Titus 2.3 about that woman, not a slave or a bondage to much wine, 
in the past with present effects. It's talking about what her problem was in the past. She has to have been already free from it with the present effects. And then 1 Timothy 5, 23, not understanding what the Greek says, that what it's, we went over today, and that no bishop or minister could have alcohol. Paul would have never commanded him to have alcohol with, with water. No way. It was talking about grape juice with the antioxidants to help his stomach. Common thing that they did in the ancient days. So the bottom line is, abstaining from all alcohol and intoxication is absolutely, clearly, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the truth that is brought forth in the Word of God, and that should be the stand of every Christian. And I encourage you to take that stand upon the Word of God and make sure that you have nothing to do with it and share this truth with others to help them to come to the place of walking in the truth and being holy before the Lord. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God regarding the subject of alcohol and strong drink, alcoholic wine. I thank you that as I receive the Word, I see the truth, and I understand that the deception that has gone forth in the body of Christ is because of poor scholarship, not understanding the true meanings of the words, and not studying sufficiently to discover the truth. I thank you that I see the truth. The word condemns alcohol. I am to abstain from all alcohol and intoxication. And I take that stand, and I will walk holy before the Lord all the days of my life. Thank you for revelation of the truth from the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. I trust this has been a series, and we're finished with this series, and we'll be talking on something totally different tonight. I trust the series, we've been lengthy in it, but at the same time, we left nothing, no stone unturned. And I think more than anything, this should have taught you not only the false teaching that's out there, the poor scholarship and the problems we have, but also, we gotta know the word. And also, we gotta look up every word. And also, we can't, we got, if we don't study and do due diligence, we got a problem. I mean, think of anybody even out in the world, in any profession. If you don't do your due diligence to do everything and do it right, you're not gonna be successful, are you? That's true, it's us, us in the word of God. We've got to have our due diligence and study the Word and find out exactly what it says and know beyond a shadow of a doubt. The Word fits. The Word, you know, God doesn't condemn alcohol one place and then say, oh, it's okay over here. <laughs> well, that, that's, that'd make him hypocritical, wouldn't it? That doesn't make any sense at all. No. The Word is absolutely the truth. And so there's no question about what has come forth. And I trust this has helped you. And I encourage you to really get in the Word, study the Word. we got to know the Word and share this with others. You know, the answer for anybody you know it's an alcoholic is don't send them to AA. Send them to my website and watch these 10 messages. By the time they watch these 10 messages, they'll come to the place saying, yeah, I'm through with that. Show me how I can get, cast these demons out and get set free. Get me somebody and start working with me and get these demons out of me. Because that's the answer once they've come to the place of confession of sin, godly sorrow, knowing the truth, repentance, and then starting casting out the demons. That's what they need. AA will do you nothing. They have to say, I am an alcoholic, you know, like you're one forever. <laughs> no, you're not. You are to be free. God wants you to be set free. So encourage others to go to this. And um, I am working on writing a book on this, I decided, so that this will be out in due season. Praise the Lord. God bless. Tonight we are going to talk on another subject and actually be on the subject of the conditions that are necessary for you to get the mercy of God. It's a very important subject. People just assume that they, God's going to be merciful to them. Not so, unless you meet the conditions. We'll be talking about that tonight. God bless. Need prayer? Come forward. Have a wonderful afternoon. We'll hope to see you tonight, 6.30. You're dismissed.